I'm waiting, waiting for the thumbs up. Thumbs up, okay. Um, well, welcome everybody uh, to this discussion on the human face uh, of climate change. I'm, I'm, I'm just willing to, I'm not, this seems to be cutting in and out, okay. Uh, I, okay, we'll start again. Welcome to this session on the human face of climate change. I'm Justin Worland, a senior correspondent at Time Magazine, where I write about climate change. Uh, I'm really happy to be leading this discussion on so-called human capital, uh, looking at the ways that investing in uh, humans, individuals, uh, community capacity can foster inclusive development and help address climate change. Um, for those of us joining virtually, we would invite you to share your thoughts in the Q&A. There are experts from the World Bank who are answering questions. You can also follow the conversation on Twitter with the hashtags investinpeople and uh, hashtag climateactionwbg. Um, we're going to, uh, I'll introduce the entire panel uh, in just a minute, but first uh, I'm going to welcome uh, uh, Mari Pangust, Peng, excuse me, Peng Jestu, sorry, uh, who is the Managing Director of Development Policy and Partnerships at the World Bank. Uh, she oversees the research and data group of the World Bank, the work program of the World Bank's global practices, groups, and external and corporate relations functions. Uh, welcome, Mari. Thank you. Okay, is, can you hear me? Is that fine? Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Justin. Uh, and it's great to be uh, on this panel uh, on a very important uh, topic, which is uh, looking at the human face uh, affecting climate change. Because we talk a lot about energy, technology, uh, financing, but uh, we must put people at the center uh, of the climate change, as we all say. So what does that really mean? I think because this session is called the human face of climate change, I want all of you to think about what's the human face that brings into your mind when you think about climate change. For me, it's a mother of six from Yemen. Uh, she's featured in our human face uh, videos uh, on the World Bank uh, website. So she's a mother of six from Yemen who, co who spends many, many hours collecting water every day with the help of her children and the children missing school and she missing uh, the ability to, to work. A simple rainwater harvesting system that we introduced changed everything so that the kids could, could go to school and she could work. There are many images that you will have. My other image is the children in uh, Sumatra who, who became cognitively affected because of the forest fires uh, in Sumatra back in the 90s. So these are the human faces uh, of climate change. Uh, and fortunately, every day, uh, the news is full of stories about climate change and its impact on people's lives through the whole life cycle. And let me just take one example, the effect of extreme heat. UNICEF now estimates that 559 million children are exposed four or more heat waves per year. Research from Harvard shows that each degree increase in temperature over a school year reduces learning that year by 1%. Even small setbacks in health and learning have re repercussions into adulthood. And adults are also suffering. Lancet estimates that extreme heat resulted in 470 billion hours of lost work in 2021. In our China CCDR, the increased fre frequency and duration and intensity of heat waves outdoor affected can, will affect worker product productivity in some provinces in China by 2 to 15% by 2016. And sometimes these numbers look overwhelming, but imagine these effects on your own family, on your children missing school, on poor health and loss of earnings. So I just wanted to bring up those images for you uh, as we talk about how we must really uh, uh, recognize that climate and development are fundamentally connected. Countries must tackle both objectives and uh, really look 
at the, how climate shocks is having a big impact uh, on human uh, capital. So we need to invest in people, their health, education, and ensuring that we have well-targeted support during a crisis so that we can build resilience and improve people's adaptive uh, capacity. Uh, and investments in building human capital is key uh, because people are the ones who will drive innovations and adaptation to address global climate crisis. And they must also be the ones that will be able to take up the opportunities if we are going to have a green, resilient uh, and inclusive uh, development. So we need to invest more in smart health systems uh, and make sure that the social protection programs are really uh, taking care uh, of the people who are most affected. Uh, here in Egypt, just as an example, we're using the private sector and social media data to understand what skills renewable energy companies need and help prepare people for empowerment opportunities in this growing sector. I'm looking forward to our discussion uh, and exploring how we can put people at the center of the global response uh, to this crisis. Beginning with people who are most affected by and uh, vulnerable to climate change. Women, poor people, and other typically marginalized groups. While recognizing that people are the drivers of successful mitigation, it will require healthy and skilled uh, people to work in the new green economy jobs. So we really need focused um, investments in human capital and inclusive po policies if we are really gonna achieve green, resilient, and inclusive development. Thank you. Thank you, Mari. That set the stage really well, connecting the human face to those investments. Um, so I'm going to introduce the panel now. Um, we have the Honorable Nancy Timbo, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Malawi. Uh, until earlier this year, she served as Minister of Forestry and Natural Resources and has twice been elected a member of the country's National Assembly. Uh, next, we have Kathy uh, Berman McLeod, who is director of the Adrian Ash uh, Arsht Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center at the Atlantic Council, where she leads work to develop scalable policy, uh, financial and technological solutions. Previously, she served as global environmental and social risk executive at Bank of America. Uh, and then finally, we have Professor Nicholas Stern, is the IG Patel Professor of Economics uh, and Government Chairman of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, uh, uh, excuse me, and the Environment, and Head of the India Observatory at the London School of Economics. Uh, also a former World Bank Chief Economist. So um, we're going to uh, first uh, see a video uh, to sort of set the context for the first section of our, of our conversation, which will be about adaptation. Uh, so this video will, will give some um, uh, over, overview into adaptive social protection. So. regions in the world, and it is severely affected by climate change. Despite hard work, millions of people struggle to make a living, lacking capital, living far away from markets, and having limited education or skills. For women, gender norms pose an additional challenge. To alleviate poverty and protect poor families from shocks, governments in the Sahel and across the world are expanding social safety nets. These programs provide regular assistance, typically through cash transfers, and help millions of families with their daily needs. In recent years, many governments have complemented safety nets with additional support to help families improve their own livelihoods and build resilience. Four countries in the Sahel, Burkina Faso, Mauritania, Niger, and Senegal, have developed an innovative set of productive measures to help safety net beneficiaries thrive in their economic activities. The productive inclusion measures changed lives. Communities built strong social dynamics. Beneficiaries grew their off-farm businesses and increased their revenues. Food security improved. The Sahel experience shows that productive inclusion programs can be delivered effectively at scale through safety net systems. They can be a powerful tool for countries that seek to improve the livelihoods of the poor, stimulate inclusive growth, and build resilience of their more vulnerable populations.
Great. Okay, well, building off of that video, uh, Minister uh, Timbo, I'd, I'd like to come to you with the first question. The video shows the potential for social protection programs to build resiliency. Uh, in Malawi, what are the most urgent priorities to invest in people to help uh, adapt to the changing climate? Yes, uh, good evening, and uh, I'm honored to be amongst this uh, distinguished panel and to share the experiences of Malawi. We have a program, a social protection program, and it has over 300,000 over 300, families. What it does, it of course enhances resilience, um, but we've had a fair share of climate change um, extreme weather. And this year we had uh, Cyclone Anna. Now, this social protection uh, support helps a family to build resilience, but the impacts of the extreme weather that I, we are experiencing mean that whilst government is doing something to support these vulnerable families, then you have an, uh, uh, an extreme weather situation, then you're back to a situation where you were before. And from a country such as Malawi, an LDC country, extreme weather are really having a, such a negative impact as compared to other nations. Recently, we had uh, hurricanes in Florida. In Florida, the destruction was massive, but the resilience is there, so they're able to recover. In Malawi, in 2019, we had Cyclone Idai. Cyclone Idai had, extreme, had this, such an impact, to, up to date, people have not recovered. So what we are trying to do as a government, one of our other priorities is to invest in education. Our belief is that if we invest in education, we are able to build more resilience. A family that is more educated is more able to be innovative, is more able to try and empower itself. When they get the social protection, they are better able to use it and build resilience for the family, they are better able to send their kids to school. If they start a business, that business is who is likely to succeed because of uh, the, it's a literate family, the, the mother is educated, and so the government of Malawi is investing in education. Something else we are trying to do is to include most of the rural areas in the energy grid, renewable energies. We have now a policy where we're encouraging uh, renewable energy, solar panels, the simple solar panels that bring light to a family. If you bring light to a family, they are able to watch TV, they are able to expose the family. And so investment in renewable energy is one of those uh, uh, efforts that the government of Malawi is making, making sure that more people have access to energy, more people have access to health uh, systems. If you have a health system in a rural area and you have energy supply, renewable energy supply, it means families are able to live better lives, their children are get educated. And the other thing that we have done is to ensure that we invest in uh, water supply. A family that has water supply is, is more likely to have children that are, are going to school. Because then it's not hard work going to school. They are able to, um, in the morning, they go to school. They don't have to draw water far from far. So they'll be in school. They'll be maybe tired. And uh, I think what exposed us to ensure that we have to move with speed to invest in water was the COVID situation. When we had the COVID situation, we encouraged families to wash up and sanitize. And yet you are telling, you wash up, make sure you, and yet there is no water. The, the water uh, sup, uh, supply is a, a kilometer away. How do we encourage a family to wash up and sanitize? So these are some of the things that we are doing to make sure that we build more resilience. 
families are better able to cope. Families get educated. Once you educate them, you're better able even to sensitize them on the impacts of climate change, how they can adapt, how they can be more resilient, and how they can relate climate change to their own well-being. Thank you. Thank, thank you. That was a very, very well said connection between these uh, basic development needs and, and climate resilience. Um, uh, Kathy, I, I want to come to to you next. Uh, you work on uh, adaptation uh, for heat, but uh, uh, but also adap adaptation. I, I want to ask you about adaptation broadly, and just to, to take you know we have a very specific perspective from Malawi. Broadly speaking, what needs to be done? What needs to be invested in to help people adapt to the effects of climate change? Thank you. I think the, the key word is people and livelihoods, and people need to create income and need resources for all the things that we all need, food and shelter. And the idea of climate adaptation and climate resilience and mobilizing capital and scale and all of these wonky words that we use, um, the human being gets lost in those words and we use um, in the climate world uh, acronyms and they, they're meaningless to people who are suffering from extreme heat and many your numbers are um, terrifying, sobering, and those are the numbers we know. And what is so important about what the minister said about education is that we don't understand heat enough. And so we know it's uh, knocking back worker productivity, and that's money that comes to the worker and money that comes into the economy in that service or product that's being created by them. And so getting very practical about what people need to continue to work in the face of climate effects, especially heat, and we could talk about all of them, but, but we're focused at, um, our Strock is short for that long name that you said, Justin, um, on, on extreme heat and the way that it affects people and their bodies. This is about the human body that slows down and makes mistakes and their uh, hand-eye coordination is off and they're tired and they make, whether they're sitting at a computer or they're working outside. And so very practical things like the tools that uh, we work with SEVA, the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is a two million strong female um, informal a sector union of women, and oftentimes the tools they use are so hot, it burns their hands, they can't finish the work. They're also tired and, and having a hard time, and so thinking about what are the tools that they need to continue to work. And so thinking about financial tools and financial resilience for heat, and these apply across the other hazards, of course, but the financial tools like um, income replacement uh, products that when it um, is a certain temperature or condition, uh, people get paid to stay home. And so thinking of in um, all different contexts, not a sick day, but a heat day. And you get paid to your cell phone if you're in the informal sector and your life lasts longer and your kids have a better chance of getting a good education. And so what are those kinds of tools? And those tools are based on data. And so we need to have increased understanding of not just the cost of heat, but the, the data around mortality and morbidity to build better um, products, but those products and their success are always based on the education, on understanding how is heat um, affecting the human body, how does it slow us down, and one of the best tools for mitigating the heat, for reducing the heat, is nature. And nature-based solutions can be a, a, um, a tool for mitigation of climate, but in cities where we focus and where 60% uh, of the world will be in the next 10 years, I think is the number, um, we're really focused on how nature can cool cities. And we have named chief heat officers around the world. We have one, I was telling the minister, in Freetown, 
um, and Eugenia Cardbo has just been named one of uh, Time's 100 Next Leaders in the future, so thank you, Time. Um, Lenya Mirvilli is in the audience here. She is the UN Habitat Chief Heat Officer. She started in Athens. And so building an education, building an understanding, building awareness, naming heat waves is one of our, um, uh, we're experimenting with naming heat waves and health-based heat uh, categorization. And so we use different ways to reach people through the Red Cross First Aid app. And so how do you get information in the hands for people to make better decisions? And then what sort of tools, not just the tools that you hold in your hand, but how do you use financial tools to uh, protect people's health? And that's our priority. So thank you. Great. Great financial tools and tools in people's hands as well. Okay, Nick, I, I want to come to you. Um, uh, oftentimes adaptation, investment in adaptation gets framed around, uh, you know, protecting against losses, and that's, of course, true, but, but I, I want to ask you just about, about the opportunities for uh, growth uh, from adaptation, investment in adaptation, and, and human-centric adaptation. What are the opportunities for, for growth? Thank you, thank you very much. Um, and uh, in answering, is is working? Or a bit wobbly, yeah? Is is working now? Okay. Yeah. Okay. This one seems. Oh my goodness! Even better. Um, I don't know what you did to it, but it was very good. The uh, answering that question, Justin, I uh, am influenced by uh, my dear friend Felipe Calderon, president of Mexico, who's in the front row. About 10 years ago, um, we set up the Global uh, Commission on Economy and, and Climate. Uh, Felipe was the chair, I was co-chair, and we argued that, um, and uh, published a report, Better Growth, Better Climate, just before Paris. And uh, uh, Felipe had, had chaired the uh, COP um, 16 in, in, in Cancun in 2010. So we argued that uh, if you act on climate change, and we were talking about mitigation and, and adaptation, um, much of what we do is both. Yeah? and argued that uh, actually if you do these things well, there are lots of employment opportunities, you avoid the destruction associated with climate change through, some of it anyway, through adaptation. And uh, we argued that you, know, you could actually see strong action, mitigation, and adaptation, and climate change coming with um, uh, increased uh, output, a bit through job opportunities and so on. In that time, since then, uh, over this last uh, eight, nine years, I think we've come to see that story somewhat differently. In other words, that the kinds of things that we're describing here, in both adaptation and mitigation, are drivers of growth. It's not that you can put them together, and if you're smart, do not too badly, and avoid a bit of tension, and, and avoid a too heavy trade-off is much stronger than that. It's a dynamic story where uh, the, the drive to net zero, the drive to have strong adaptation and resilience actually drives growth. Um, and there's so many examples, but you know, if you think of uh, schools which you build in a more resilient way to make them centers, when some um, extreme event strikes. So they're a place where you can gather and go. Um, and you need these public places and schools are, are examples. You can actually um, make yourself much stronger and of course, in other words, have much higher income if you uh, create that. And at the same time, you're investing in a public institution which is gonna have big returns in human capital at the, uh, at, at, the same, at the same time. So I think it's very important to think of these things in terms of uh, mitigation and adaptation at the, uh, at, the same, at the same time. So much of what we do, restoring degraded land, is mitigation, adaptation, and development. If you restore degraded land, you capture carbon in the soil, you make the farmer much more resilient to bad weather conditions, and uh, you increase income. 
So the examples there, well, the first one I gave was where you, you know, build the school as a public place uh, uh, initially for adaptation, but you know, it helps you invest in the, uh, in, in the human capital as well. Um, restoring degraded land is a big part of that story. Uh, decentralized solar. It's adaptation, mitigation, and development. You know, the decentralized solar is more robust than a grid, yeah? And of course, uh, it is reducing uh, emissions, and it's creating new opportunities. Often the decentralized solar, I've worked in India for most of my adult life, and often uh, with decentralized solar, the women in the village can use the uh, solar panel to start up a little business uh, around charging mobile phones. So there are some examples where adaptation clearly is uh, helping drive growth, and there are many, many examples where adaptation and mitigation together help drive uh, the growth story. Um, so I think these, these effects are, are really uh, very powerful. And there's so much, you know, if you bring, as we heard, if you bring water supply, it's a much greater productivity on health um, if the women uh, are educated. They use it uh, in a much uh, better, better way. So the examples are really uh, everywhere. And we should see mitigation, adaptation, and growth as all part of the uh, same story and same opportunity, so that good climate policy is the growth story of the 21st century. Excellent. I love that, that many of the same themes and, and, and uh, ideas have been connected through each of you. Um, so, so we're going to close this section with, with Mari and just um, to ask, uh, you know, obviously for developing countries, uh, they need finance to make this happen. Uh, what can institutions like the World Bank do to make investments in human-centered uh, or in human capital uh, uh, for climate resilience happen? working? Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, thanks uh, for your question. I think a lot has been said. Uh, and uh, obviously, financing, uh, you know, the World Bank has prioritized uh, financing for climate. 35% of our uh, financing is for climate. Uh, and 50% of that is for adaptation. So in terms of priority, I think it's very clear uh, where we are coming from. But I think that's not enough uh, to be able to address uh, the big scale and urgency uh, of addressing both mitigation and adaptation, let alone uh, the, the impact, uh, the human capital uh, impact. So uh, I think we, we need to address it in a very uh, comprehensive way, including in partnership with other development partners, with bilateral partners, and most importantly with the government. I think uh, starting with the government's uh, domestic resource mobilization, how should governments prioritize their spending, including on human capital. So I, I think the way the minister from Malawi described it uh, was, uh, you know, very well because it's saying you need the access to the basic services like water and, and electricity. Uh, and at the same time, you want to make sure they can get access to health services and uh, education services. And this is something where we notice that uh, with, because of COVID, a lot of governments cut their spending on education as well as on health. And this is something that we need to make sure, uh, including with support from international institutions, that that doesn't happen because you are going to talk about a lost generation, right? And it worsens even uh, the impact uh, from uh, climate change. So that that's effective spending on human capital from the from the governments themselves, uh, and prioritizing the learning losses that happened during COVID, uh, recapturing the learning losses is priority, and that can be supported from uh, international institutions like the bank. And then on mitigation and adaptation that uh, Nick mentioned, as well as, I think, protecting nature um, and biodiversity, those are linked, and they impact the most vulnerable people the, and the most vulnerable countries the most. And this is where I think we have to prioritize our financing to make sure that um, 
you know, it's, it's not just adaptation, but mitigation overall, because it's mitigation that will reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that is leading to this warming of temperatures. The extreme temperatures, the extreme weather events are, are totally related to the fact that you have to start mitigating. And so that, that's not just the issue of uh, the poorest countries, but it's the issue of globally, including the advanced countries, including the middle income, uh, large emitters. And then when you talk about adaptation, a lot of that is with the lower income countries, but in all countries you have mitigation and adaptation. And how do you address uh, adaptation, especially for the vulnerable countries? I think there's, that's again, uh, uh, something we need to, to look at holistically, uh, starting from the early warning system, disaster risk management, but building in the resilience, much in the way uh, our uh, other panelists have said, uh, in terms of uh, pre uh, prevention and preparedness. Uh, I mean, c my country has had uh, tsunamis and earthquakes, and early warning systems have helped to at least reduce the, the, the losses. The losses still happen, uh, but the, you can reduce the losses if uh, you had a good uh, disaster risk management system. And then you have to build the resilience uh, of, the, of the people impacted, or whether it's the, the uh, social support, uh, targeted social support, much like what uh, the Minister of Malawi mentioned, uh, or access to health systems. Uh, and finally, you know, livelihoods. How to how to have continued uh, livelihoods. So maybe maybe I'll stop there. <laughs> That's a, a very helpful framework um, to think about 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 these investments. Um, uh, so we've we've touched on mitigation a bit, but this was the moment where I was going to sort of transition us, and I was going to ask Kathy uh, perhaps to share some thoughts about the link between adaptation and mitigation. We've heard a bit of it already, but I'd love to have you come in on that. Sorry about that. <laughs> I jumped the gun. Uh, I, in terms of mitigation and adaptation, I think focusing on um, livelihoods and jobs and the role that uh, addressing, and again, we focus uh, a lot of our work on extreme heat, and so focusing on what are the nature-based solutions, urban forests, green roofs, cool roofs, uh, lighter surfaces, uh, what are the clothes that we're gonna need to wear that are going to keep us uh, comfortable and healthy in a hotter world. There are all sorts of economic opportunities and job training that will come from the world we need to adapt to. And it's happening now, it's not a future thing. Um, I recently visited Australia, we formed a partnership uh, with several organizations there in Melbourne and Sydney, and there's a machine called the EMU. And the EMU is a little robot that tells the Australian Open players when they should play and when they should stop playing on a scale of one to five, given the particulate matter and air pollution, the temperatures and the um, the humidity and so there's a recommendation and so something like the emu needs to be on every school playground in every athletic field in every business where people work outside on every job site that's just one example of what um, a future of um, jobs look like for adaptation now to mitigation um, they often go together uh, the nature-based solutions are one of the best ways to do that, but a lot of technologies will be both mitigation and adaptation. But I think focusing on the most vulnerable, um, mitigation should be a bonus if it happens. I, it's hard to, um, if, it, if it's easy, it certainly shouldn't be the priority. I think the adaptation that sustains your health and your livelihood, your water system, your ability to go to school and access to health care, um, part of the problem of adaptation is an expectation of return on investment and adaptation that would mirror the return we had in uh, extracting what we extracted the first time. And so I think an expectation about investing in adaptation and the idea that we will have um, returns that mirror, we're, we're needing to lower expectations and that the um, 
the investments that we make in adaptation need to be about human life and human health and about safe and healthy communities. And those externalities need to be internalized. That's not what you asked me, but it's a really important part because everybody says, let's make the business case for adaptation. And um, it's a human case for adaptation. That's the case we should be making. Okay, uh, absolutely, um, a, a good point in any climate discussion about internalizing externalities. Um, let's let's go to go to Nick. Uh, just to, and you touched on this um, uh, uh, a little bit, but um, I, I just want to ask about about justice and equity, and and you know how how do you ensure that the most vulnerable will benefit from these investments that we're talking about? Um, so Nick, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it, injustice is associated with deprivation of rights, and uh, the most important right in this context is the right to development, you know, the, the right to help shape your life in a way that uh, improves the living standards as you see them for your family and, and so on. And uh, that's the way in which I think we should see injustice, and uh, avoiding injustice is the story of transition. Um, so with that sort of understanding of what it means, um, let me give examples where you make uh, investments for adaptation and uh, mitigation which improve opportunities. And a second kind of example where you make investments to prevent dislocation. Yeah. So um, often these things overlap, but I think one is the positive side, creation of opportunities, and the other is handling the dislocation and avoiding uh, harm to people. So in the first uh, category, you know, I've already mentioned uh, uh, um, you know, uh, restoring degraded land and uh, decentralized solar. If you think of other important examples, public transport is uh, extremely important in reducing emissions, but also uh, is key when uh, life gets difficult. It is also something where poor people generally benefit more than uh, rich people, uh, whether it's through uh, avoided pollution or whether it's through being able to travel to find, uh, find work. So those are examples where you create opportunity. Long, long ago in 1969, my first applied project, when I'd just come out of graduate school, was smallholder tea in Kenya. And uh, it was uh, a program where it was just after independence and land was being redistributed, and uh, smallholders, predominantly women, were trained, human capital, in the growing of tea. And of course, you had to collect the tea, inspect the tea, take the tea to the tea factory. It was a classic example of education and infrastructure uh, coming together. We weren't so absorbed by climate change. Hello? Hello? How about this one? <laughs> Did you hear anything of what I said? <laughs> okay. You, let me, you, you heard it up to the T, but not, okay. 1969, uh, an even younger Stern, just out of graduate school, <laughs> goes to look at tea in Kenya, but smallholder tea in Kenya. Just after independence, land redistribution, small plots of land, uh, women um, who were the entrepreneurs and the cultivators uh, were given the, uh, the, 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 the little the sort of shoots to plant and uh, you had to wait for three or four years to get a result. This is entrepreneurship, right? But it's human capital in the training. It's infrastructure to get the, build the roads, to get the teas to the tea factory. So it's private sector at the bottom end with the women growing the tea, private sector at the top end when you've got the tea factory and you've got public infrastructure and training in the middle. And actually looking back, although we didn't talk about climate change then, this was 69, 
um, it was actually a story where you know that you're growing the tree. It, it is a tree, right? I mean, it uh, and it also strengthens the life opportunities and avoids the uncertainties. So that was uh, the, uh, the big formative applied project of my life, which put actually everything that matters together. But it was human capital, it was adaptation, it was mitigation. We hardly used any of those words at that time. But that's what it uh, was. So there's so many examples where you create opportunity and at the same time you uh, protect and you mitigate and you capture carbon. The other side is the dislocation. We are transforming economies here. We're getting out of coal. It uh, makes a very big difference to uh, many people's place of work, what they can do. And there's the sort of supportive side to stop um, uh, some people suffering unduly as a result of radical economic change. And that means investment. It means investment in people, human capital, and it means investment in places, because often uh, those uh, losses of work are concentrated in particular places. So there are those two types of investment where if you are concerned about a just transition, not damaging people's livelihoods, enhancing them, particularly the poorer people, where you have to act. The creation of opportunity, there's so many examples and all of us have uh, given them whilst protecting livelihoods. And the other one, avoiding the consequences of change, being focused on particular people in particular places. And that means uh, helping them, investing in them and investing in those places. And did you hear all that? <laughs> did you remember all that? <laughs> Well, thank you, thank you for that. Um, very, very interesting, very compelling. Um, uh, Mar Mari, I, I want to come to you next. Uh, I, I was going to ask you about about um, you know different ways that uh, that um, uh, that you know the World Bank can help uh, invest in human capital. You've touched on that already. <laughs> I want to pick up on 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 something Nick said. Okay, uh, which is j just about um, about uh, about calling calling it. We can ju just try it. Uh, this one seems to be working for now. Okay, about about uh, not calling things mitigation and adaptation, et cetera, before, but but doing that. And, and I'm just curious about human capital. How much uh, do we need to be thinking about human capital as a separate investment, and how much of it is just distributed across the bank's work in other areas? We focus, of course, on human capital uh, in, in, as a focus point. Yeah, uh, we have a human capital project which looks at all the, a lot of the dimensions um, of human capital. But in in the context of climate change, uh, I think one of the issues that Nick raised, and I was in uh, many sessions on what's called just transition. If we want to have the ambition to reduce mitigation, it will and transform economies it will lead to uh, distributional effects, if you like. And uh, I think I heard uh, the Secretary General from the UN, he said, okay, just transition means making sure the jobs lost uh, are, uh, uh, are going to be gained uh, with the new uh, growth story that Nick is describing. But that's not always matching, right? The jobs lost from coal mining and, uh, and petroleum sector are not necessarily easily transferable to new, new green jobs, for instance. So you do have to have a very uh, focused policy on that. And this is one of, the one of the biggest political economy challenges that country face. And uh, we, we are just doing a project in South Africa, for instance, the first World Bank decommissioning of a coal plant. Uh, and a large part of the of the loan is actually uh, addressing this very issue, the just transition, to make sure that uh, uh, you know you can create the jobs uh, for those who lost their jobs uh, in the coal mi coal mining and in the coal in the provinces that were reliant on coal. Right. So this is uh, about climate smart 
education or training uh, for the green jobs, for the jobs of the future. And, it, and it's at all levels. It's about the researchers, the scientists, the STEM education that you want to have to have the innovation. Uh, it's about uh, the experts who are going to be able to uh, mainstream climate into your policies, including businesses, because businesses have to respond to ESG and all that. And it is also uh, at, the, at the working level, you know, uh, uh, green jobs. And uh, we heard an, a good example in that just transition uh, session that I was in, uh, this very big company called Renew Energy, the one from India. Yeah, this one is the largest uh, solar uh, cell company in, in India. And India went in a big way to renewable energy. And he was telling the story of how they created jobs for women. Uh, in these solar panel uh, factories uh, as, as a creation of green jobs. So the private, it's not just the government, but the private sector. Government can provide the training uh, that's needed. Final thing I would say is that, you know, I, I think STEM education is going to be important. Uh, and uh, I just want to make a call that it, we may, must make sure that girls also get the, right, the STEM education. Uh, uh, <laughs> because this is going to be crucial uh, for, uh, for the future and, and inclusiveness. And the fi I have to do this advertisement, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, did you know that evidence shows that women's participation and leadership in climate action is associated with better resource governance, conservation outcome, and disaster readiness. We, we believe it, right? <laughs> so we have a whole session of this on Monday at 9 a.m. right here in this uh, pavilion, so please come. <laughs> that was my advertisement, sorry for that. <laughs> No, thank, thank you for that, uh, for that advertisement. It sounds like an interesting uh, event. Um, I, I want to go, we just have last, one last question. We'll close with uh, Minister Timbo. Um, Malawi has the lowest GHG uh, per capita emissions in the world and, and is yet is making uh, strides to green its economy. I guess I just wanted to close uh, with you and, and, and to ask a little bit uh, about what policies your government uh, is pursuing uh, to encourage private sector uh, green growth, to prepare people to participate uh, in green jobs. Again, coming back to that human, human face. Closer to your mouth, I think. Let me just, when I, I was talking about the priorities that our government is investing in. And uh, let me just paint a picture of a, a community, one, a community adaptation <laughs> adaptation a community that has no water a community that has no electricity a community that has a school that is a kilometer away a community that has its forest degraded because they have to use the firewood for domestic uh, cooking. So that, imagine that community and a government such as Malawi that depends on agriculture and not, it's an LDC country. So it has to ensure that it leaves that community, develops that community. And Stan here talks about a right to development. So this community, the government has to do so much to lift this community. And what it's doing is investing in education, investing in, in, in health, and investing in water supply and sanitation, and it's investing in um, energy. Now, we need the private sector now to come in. Because government, the envelope that government has cannot afford to do all these things private sector then has to come in. If we're going to do value addition, it should be the private sector leading in that endeavor. Value addition, other than selling raw crops, we have to do the value addition. 
If we are talking about renewable energy, it has to be private sector because they have the resources. What we do now is to, to ensure that they are enabled to produce, for example, solar panels, or you, you uh, remove all the levies on all these raw materials that they require to produce the equipment that is needed to produce the uh, renewable energy. And we have to uh, encourage the private sector to do irrigation, to do irrigation farming in order to, uh, to ensure food security. So they're going to do irrigation. We are now investing in fish farming, aquaculture. Government is not going to go all the way because aquaculture, it improves livelihoods. You don't need a lot of land, farming land. So from a small piece of land, you're able to get water. You're able to do fish farming. You're able to... Uh, families around that air are better, are, are healthy because then you are doing water harvesting, the aquaculture, gaining livelihoods from that. So there's so much that the private sector can do. But most importantly, the apart from that, I just want to uh, delve into something that I've been talking about with friends on the issue of debt relief for nature. Countries such as Malawi really are in a very bad spot at the moment. And all the resources that they have can, are not enough to pay for the high debt that we have, not enough to ensure development, which is a right, as Tena said. And it is embedded in our constitution. So to, uh, to urge Madrat organizations to, ensure, to, to go into some sort of arrangement with LDCs that this debt that these LDCs have to pay either to bilateral or, um, uh, countries or to the Madrat organizations, this can be now channeled towards landscape restoration. Because if we don't restore our, our land, then we have a problem. Our forests are depleted. We need a lot of money. A country such as Malawi has pledged to restore 4.5 million hectares of land. But in order to do that, we need the resources. So apart from the private sector doing their bit, we need all these materials to consider debt relief. We have a, a, a program which we call um, Adopt a Forest. So we're encouraging uh, uh, industry, business, to adopt forests as part of the corporate social responsibility. So they will be able to fund a community to regenerate a forest. And if you come to Malawi, there is you know, a few uh, forests that have been restored to their old uh, situation because private sector has taken an interest to help those communities, provided the resources, and now the community has been sensitized and they are protecting their own forests. They are doing beekeeping instead of doing charcoal. They are doing income generation using the natural resources and now protecting the forest because they are now realize the benefit. So there is so much that private sector can do. Help governments uh, to improve communities because in the long run, if it's to their benefit. If a community is better sensitized, is better developed, it means the community can now uh, buy their products, they can now, they have uh, a state clientele to do, uh, to, uh, to service. So it is important and imperative that private sector takes part in climate change mitigation and adaptation. Government will do its best, its part, but it, without pri private sector, there's not much that can be achieved. So I think everybody can see, and do, we commend uh, those as private sector that is involved because that's the only way they can grow their business if they can develop the, the communities. Thank you. I don't have too much to say other, other than thank you. It was a great discussion, touched on everything from education, heat, uh, some of the macroeconomic benefits and then what the bank and, and, and multilateral institutions can do. Um, uh, I, I'm coming away with, with this thinking about obviously mainstreaming climate has been a conversation, but mainstreaming the human face of climate because I think that's such a, 
Uh, there's so many ways to do that. Um, thank you to the distinguished panel. Thank you to the audience. Uh, it's been a great discussion.